Hey, this is the Fight Nerd, and with me today is the Fight Professor, Stephen Quadras. Mr. Quadras, how's it going today? It's going good. Uh, the, fun, the sun finally came out here in Los Angeles. No more rain, so uh, uh, I'm feeling good. It's a bathroom morning, and uh, I'm here for the Fight Nerd. Is it a good morning to play some Call of Duty, or is that for later in the day? <laughs> you know, I usually take a sabbatical from video gaming um, leading up to shows that I'm going to commentate on. And, of course, I'm doing Glory 5 with Remy Bonyowski versus Tyrone Spong in a couple weeks. So I haven't really fired up my PS3 in a couple days. Well, we can talk about the PS3 and the PS4 maybe later a little bit, but you did just mention Glory, so you got to talk about that. Uh, and, of course, you are a superbly busy man, as always, commentating at tons of events around the world. And coming up March 23rd in London, England, you're going to be at Glory 5, uh, which is going to be main evented, as you said, with uh, Remy Bojanski meeting Tyrone Spong. So uh, let's talk about that big match between basically a legend in kickboxing, K1 and Remy, and a man that's clearly on his way to becoming a legend. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Tyrone Spong, at 27 years old, and being 10 years the junior of the great Remy Bonyaski, uh, that's, that's where the threat is going to lie. Uh, will it be the old gunslinger retaining his title as one of the greatest in a sport, or will it be the young upstart coming into two of stage things? And both guys, you know, have similar paths to, you know, glory, so to speak. Uh, Tarman Spong is also a resident of uh, Holland, as, as Remy Poniewski, but they're both, they're both playing Suriname as their native country. And I, I think that there's going to be a situation where Poniewski took a couple of years off. Uh, he had an eye injury, and so he got into training fighters. Then the injury healed, and he came back. And uh, he fought a really tough match with a guy named, you know, who attended, Anderson Silva. And no, it wasn't the UFC middleweight champion. There's actually probably more than one other person from Brazil named Anderson Silva. And this was a really big threat. They fought into a fourth round on a previous glory event. And Bonyashi well, got the win. But now he's, things are going to be steeper because he's facing the powder-packed uh, punches of Tyron Spong. And Spong is really going to try and bring the heat that night. There in XL Arena in London. And uh, stylistically, how do these two guys match up? Well, Spawn is sort of a, a shorter Mike Tyson esque punching machine. Uh, you know, he does throw kicks and these occasionally, but he's going to have uh, a little bit of a deficit there in the height. But as far as the outside, he's going to come in throwing overhand punches, hooks, going to the body, going to the head, staying out of the way of the flying knees and kicks. Now, when you ask he, it's got a very busy style and a very uh, cardio uh, intensive style because all the jumping that he does with the flying knees and the, and the head kicks and the flying kicks, that you know takes a lot out of your reserve tank. And at 37 years old, how far will it take him before he hits the wall to face? That's the, that's the key there. Uh, Ponyaski probably want to keep it on the outside, keep moving, where it's long. He's going to want to trap Ponyaski upon the ropes and unload. And then basically two weeks later, you're going to be uh, in Istanbul for Glory 6 on April 6th. Uh, and that's going to be the meeting of two very strong fighters, Gokan Saki and uh, Daniel Gita. They're going to be meeting in the ring. So let's talk about that match and what it means uh, for these two fighters. Yeah, Gokan Saki and Daniel Gita are numerically ranked by most experts, including LiberKick.com, at number two and number three position. Uh, Daniel Gita is the number two fighter. And uh, Gokan Saki is a number three fighter. Uh, the one opponent that they do have in common, among others, is Sammy Schilt, who's currently, you know, and seemed like forever, the number one uh, fighter in kickboxing. Uh, they both fought him on the night of December 31st in Japan at Glory 4, which was a 16-man heavyweight kickboxing tournament. Well, Sammy Schilt ended up uh, winning that tournament by beating Daniel Gita in the finals with a head kick knockout. Um, he also beat Gokan Saki by decision early on. So these two men are fighting a rematch, Gita versus Saki. Is it in fact a rematch? Uh, Gita got the win by decision the last time they fought. And so they're really going to try to divide the position to fight for the individual glory heavyweight championship and also held by Semi Show. He's the tournament champion and also the individual champion. So there's a lot of stake here. Uh, Gokan Saki is of Turkish heritage. So fighting against that bull, he's going to have sort of a, what, what you call a transplanted hometown advantage there. But Gita is really, really looking sharp now. And uh, it's going to be a classic heavyweight championship 
well, I, I want to say championship, but it's actually not for a championship belt. It should be. It's, it's all, it might as well be, because this, this is like a clash of the titans. Yeah, it's going to be definitely, uh, I see that as being uh, one of the biggest matches of the year for Glory, but that's only it's only April. We still have a few more months to go before 2013 is up, so I mean, who knows what's going to happen next, uh, the rest of this year. And meanwhile, Glory is running uh, their Road to Glory tournaments as well, which uh, are a way to basically to feed talent into the company, and you guys are going to be doing uh, a show here in New York, also on the 23rd. Uh, so just kind of tell us you know, about the Road to Glory events and uh, how they've been helping uh, other Glory shows. Well, what it is is that they have the Road to Glory events, um, most of them have been in the United States, but they got one coming up in Japan. And what they do is, primarily in the upper weights of kickboxing, a lot of the European fighters, or the European trained fighters, have done extremely well. But Glory wants to expand and, you know, give jobs to, to everyone, and they want to have a representation from the United States and from other big countries where there are a lot of fans of fights. Now, as we know, when we see mixed martial arts fights, many times the American audiences, God bless them, will start to get restless and even boo when fights go to the ground. Personally, I love grappling, I love ground fighting, I like good wrestling, I like good jujitsu as long as they retain action rather than stalling. But with Glory, there's no ground fighting, so it's a great opportunity. The, the trick is because so many Americans have been indoctrinated into cross train and to learn how to grapple and learn how to wrestle. You have to be specific with only in stand-up fighting. So we need that new prop, like we had back in the days of many of the Jerry Kitas, Don the Dragon Wilson, Pete Sherman for Cunningham, and Maurice Smith, uh, who were the American representatives, for Dale Cook also, uh, who all were representatives of American kickboxers. So Road to Glory is basically uh, a system to find the best of the best who have been sneaking and, and hiding out in the background. And now it's a chance for a lot of these great stand-up fighters who have been in these small pockets in the United States and other countries to step back in and to go to the world's best uh, stand-up fighting organization really to compete with the best of the best. It seems like just these days, uh, in the past year or so, there's been a real resurgence in popularity in kickboxing, uh, especially in America. Uh, mostly, I, I would say, thanks to Glory. I mean, uh, yourself, coming from a, a martial arts background, training with, uh, I believe, Benny the Jet, and uh, your own striking background, I mean, it must just be great to see kickboxing really gaining speed again in the U.S. Well, I, I think it just a matter of common sense because like I said before, uh, mixed martial arts you know, a sport that I absolutely love and have worked in for well, well over a decade uh, one of the things is that it, it's pretty much has all the styles represented, whether it be judo, wrestling jiu-jitsu, uh, karate kickboxing, muay thai but with uh, glory it's only the standing aspect and a lot of times like I said before, uh, people do get restless when the fight goes to the ground I personally love the ground fights as well. I like the whole kid and caboodle. But my background is kickboxing. So uh, people have forgotten about some of the failures that kickboxing had when K1 came here uh, at the early part of last decade. Also when uh, the TKA had a weekly show on ESPN, when uh, a lot of the other champions were fighting on pay-per-view, like Rick Rufus and Johnny Terrio and Donald Dragon Wilson. But then it, it didn't go anywhere for one reason or another. I think part of the reason was that some of the matches were mismatches. They had the champion fighting some truck driver or something back in the day in America. So people, people, I think they, they lost interest in the sport because they didn't think it was competitive. Glory is super competitive. You get the best of the best guys fighting each other all the time in order to rank up and to get into one of the final eight-man tournaments, like the 70 kilogram tournament, which Georgia Petros won last year, or the, the heavyweight tournament, which Sammy Schultz won. You have to really cut your teeth and get, get good. And I think that uh, Americans and uh, people around the world want to compete with the best of the best. And this is a great system and a great time for the resurgence of kickboxing. Yes, absolutely. Now, uh, meanwhile, though, in Japan as well, uh, we're seeing the resurgence of mixed martial arts. Uh, and at this year's New Year's show, we had Dream 18 happening with the com combined event of glory. Uh, so I just going to ask you, I mean, is Dream back for good officially? And if they are, are when are we going to see some more from them? Uh, I hope they are. I, I really do because the, that show on New Year's Eve was a great show. It was very exciting. Uh, it was, you know, some of the best stars from Japan and people from around the world. Phil Baroni fought. Uh, a, a lot of people. You know, there was new new fighters. Um, you know, Hill will, you know, uh, made a very good impression. I think that what it is is that Dream is a separate entity from Glory. It was a partnership for the New Year's Eve. We got together and had that one partnership. Whether there will be future partnerships down the road, I, I'm not certain because I'm not in a position to make those decisions. 
it would be nice if there were. But you know, Gloria has a whole um, venue that's trying to reconstruct with the standard fighting elements and dream. You know, is tr- probably trying to keep it. You know, basically run by you know their hometown boys. You know, and things like this. So I'm not sure if they will have shows in the immediate future or the long term future, but I certainly hope so. I, I hope so too. Um. Now on to a little bit more uh, sadder news. Uh, recently, the combat sports world lost a very great fighter in the passing of uh, Mr. Ramon Deckers. And uh, I know you two are, are good friends. Uh, so could you please just tell our, uh, our listeners today why Ramon was so important to modern kickboxing and uh, maybe a favorite memory that you have uh, of being around him? Well, Ramon was uh, a really quiet man. Uh, but <laughs> it was like the old cliche. Uh, I forget that name might have been Teddy Roosevelt. Speak softly and carry a thick stick. And that was definitely Ramon Deckers. It reminds me of a story that Boss Rutten told recently on Facebook about how a friend of his early on, way back when Boss was, had never moved to the United States yet, um, a friend of his said, let's go down and see this kid, Boss, and I said, I want you to see this guy. So the skinny little blonde kid with a mullet got in there against a fully grown man. And Boss looked at his friend and said, you know, something to the effect of, well, the, the kid's going to get killed. I mean, he's going to get murdered. And then his friend just said, just keep watching, just keep watching. And Ramon just annihilated the guy, and Boss was shocked. And that was, you know, near the beginning, the dawning of the age of the diamond. Ramon Deckers uh, really didn't do anything uh, the easy way. Everything was the hard way. He fought the devil spiders right away. Uh, He basically cut his way through the featherweight, lightweight, and even moved up to welterweight divisions like a chainsaw. This this guy was the old school European macho thing. You stand there, I stand there with straight punches and kicks to see what's up. And he just absolutely was annihilating people. At the end of his career, at 95 knockouts, um, he fought the best of the best. But I think the thing that really solidified uh, Ramon's legacy, after he had almost completely dominated the European scene, which is very, very viable and very, very strong, he was one of the first phalangs, which is uh, a term called, uh, for border, in, in Thailand, it, you know, he went over there and he started to beat the Lumpini Stadium and Rush Gumber Stadium champions, which no one had really done. And it was a thing where that's the national pride and joy of Thailand is Muay Thai. When Decker beat Kuban and Luke Shaw Mai Sai Thong, it was actually the second fight because Ramon got stopped in the first fight in Europe. That rematch in Thailand, Ramon went over there and knocked him out in the first round at Lumpini Stadium, and people were shocked. They actually, the word was that they were Ramon leave the country until he had another rematch with, with Koban. <laughs> so Ramon had another rematch, and they ended up having like four fights, and I think they may have been split. I'm not sure the exact results, but Koban was, was an absolute legend. He's short, stocky, big puncher. He's kind of like a Ramon-type fighter, so he's a great legacy. He fought all the best guys. He took his gloves. Sometimes he'd book too many fights, and he would get hurt, but injured, something broken or whatever, but he'd make the animation to fight. He, he hardly ever pulled out of fights. And, you know, some, some people might say, well, that's not good for your body, but Ramon was that kind of a guy. He always pressed forward. He really epitomized the warrior instinct, that Viking instinct, is so much of what Holland has become in, in the world of kickboxing and mixed martial arts. And, and as a person, he had this understated sense of humor. He, he, was, he was a very quiet guy. He liked to joke, but he never made jokes at other people's expense. If anything, they were more at his expense or that it was just like goofiness, you know, how we all get together and say something that's just completely wacko. I mean, Matthew, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're the same way as I am being a Scorpio. Yep. Uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a thing where Ramon Deckers was the kind of guy, he was the true, world-renowned, working-class hero who became the best of the best at what he did. And, and the world of kickboxing, martial arts, and sporting at, at large will miss him. 